Okay, folks, I guess we're at time, so we'll get started. Uh, I'm Stephen Farrell, one of the co-chairs. My other co-chair, Jonathan, is approaching. <laughs> so, um, so we have a kind of a short session today. Oh, I guess this is the universe, usable formal methods research group. If you're in the wrong room, now's a good time to not be in the wrong room. There's a note well, the IRTF. Uh, we're part of the Internet Research Task Force, not the IETF, but we follow the same processes uh, to a large extent. So hopefully you're familiar with the note well. If you're remote, uh, please mute and don't send uh, video or audio unless you really need to. And our agenda for today is we have a bunch of good presentations coming up. Um, and any agenda bashing. So we have a short session, so let's try to move along. Okay, and with that, Nobody wants to bash the agenda? Great. Oh, Chris. Chris wants to bash the agenda. Yes, Chris. Oh, just a reminder, uh, blue sheets. Got to do the blue sheets. Oh, there's a, the, yes. Use the QR code, sign into the room, do all the good things. Are you, you're sliding? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Great. Um, so we have, there's a kind of a timer that will appear on the screen shortly. So that you can see the you can see the clock ticking away. I can see the clock. Well, my clock's already started. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody, um, and thank you so much for having me speak. It's it's really lovely to be here. So today I'm going to talk about using formal methods at Google, and specifically with regards to how we get security guarantees for our critical software, hardware, and protocols. But I specifically want to talk about the usability aspects of some of the tools and the tool chains that we use, and particularly how these may impede what we want to do um, going forwards. Right, so the structure of this talk is pretty simple. I'll start by saying what we currently do at Google when it comes to formal methods. Then I'll talk a little bit about what we would like to do going forward. And then I'll talk about what would help to make those things happen. Right, so this is a sample of some projects and efforts that we have going on at Google. And these are projects that make use of formal methods. And they span both hardware and software projects. I'm not going to go deeply in, into many of these, but I will tell you what they are. So Open Titan is an open source silicon-based root of trust, so it's a chip. Project Oak is a trusted execution environment that aims to provide provably private computation on the server side. Protected KVM is a Linux-based hypervisor for Android. And then the N2 formal project makes use of machine learning to perform mathematical reasoning and mathematical computations. And of course, we also put um, verified cryptographic code into our crypto libraries like Boring SSL. I've also included a publication from Google about you know, our static analysis tools that we build and that we use. Some of them make use of formal methods or have a foundation in formal methods, but they're not very sophisticated. So I'd say they actually maybe belong in a different class compared to the other efforts that I've listed here. Okay. <coughs> Doesn't seem to be. No. <laughs> right. Okay. There and, um, of course, we also have some um, internal efforts and efforts that are in the NPC and, and, and just starting up. Right. So some of these efforts have an intersection with cryptography and specifically surrounding the security guarantees that we want from the cryptography that is used in these projects. Um, but for today, I'm really going to talk about getting formally verified cryptographic code into our cryptographic libraries and also about cryptographic protocols. Right, so we have a small team at Google that focuses on doing this, and we are a fairly young team. We've been running for about a year, um, and we're part of a bigger cryptography team uh, at Google. We're the information security engineering formal team, and we have Andres, who is really the formal methods magician that does a lot of the heavy lifting with regards to getting formally verified code into our libraries. And then Bill, Brian, Jade, and Lucas are very kind individuals who help us where they can um, on top of their other Google jobs and responsibilities. But they're either working on some of the other projects that I've mentioned, or they're just very interested in formal methods and are ramping up with the tools that we use. We also get some input from senior engineers who care about how we use formal methods. Right, so basically the team wants to build formally verified security critical software and systems at Google. And we want to do this because we want to mitigate common and subtle cryptography vulnerabilities proactively. If there are guarantees to be had, we want to make sure that we have them. 
right? The team aims to cover three pillars, specifically software, hardware, and, and protocols. Mm -hmm. Software is really about getting guarantees for our cryptographic libraries. Hardware is performing verification on the crypto blocks that are used in silicon uh, roots of trusts or, or chips. But we really are more in an advisory capacity uh, when, when it comes to this pillar. Um, we don't do that much there. And sort of we're also trying to grow and expand in this area. And then protocols are really about security guarantees for all the cryptographic protocols that we would use, be they standardized, popular, ubiquitous protocols, or some internal protocols. Of course, we try to mandate standardized, well-designed, well-tested protocols um, where we can and wherever possible. Okay, so the first two pillars, software and hardware, really are about producing formally verified code. And then the protocols pillar is about verifying the logical flow of cryptographic protocols and seeing if there are any logical flaws that an attacker could exploit. Now, I mentioned that we are a very sort of small team. So currently our focus really is getting verified cryptographic code into our crypto libraries and specifically Boring SSL, which is one of our very important cryptographic libraries. And we make use of the fiat cryptography framework. And this makes use of the Koch theorem prover to provide functional correctness guarantees for cryptographic operations. And then the crypt op work, um, this helps to produce very fast, highly optimized assembly code that we can put into Boring SSL. Now, this is the workflow that you would need to follow to get verified code into, into Boring SSL. I'm not going to run through any of the components in detail, but you do have to be quite familiar with the Koch theorem prover and how it works um, as part of fiat cryptography. And then the crypt op work does some very clever stuff with assembly to produce highly optimized um, assembly. I borrowed this figure from the crypt op paper and extended it um, a little bit, so <laughs> thanks to the crypt op authors. Okay, as I mentioned, Andres is really the engineer who is responsible for getting a lot of our verified code into Boring SSL. And what started as an intern project in 2017 has now led us to having formally verified elliptic curve operations in Boring SSL. And as an example, we have um, formally verified curve 25519. And when we landed this, we saw a 20% performance improvement when we measured it across the Google fleet. So this was really a nice win for us. But we would also really like to do more. We would like to cover more libraries and, and for libraries that we use. <coughs> Google. We'd also like to cover new algorithms. And this is particularly important when we think about the PQC transition that is just around the corner. With regards to protocols, we want to look at Google critical protocols. And we also wonder if these protocol tools will be useful in our security review process when teams come to us and with interesting designs and, and new protocols that they might want to use. So we would definitely like to use more of these tools, um, but here's the problem. They are not that easy to use, right? And um, I spoke to some of the contributors who work on our team who are ramping up with the tools to give me some feedback. Um, and this is mostly about producing formally verified code that goes into our libraries. But from personal experience, I can say that a lot of this also holds true for the protocol verification tools. So to quote, uh, the initial learning is quite tricky, and the documentation is not all that great. In terms of readability, documentation, and debuggability of proof checkers, these lag behind most of the other code that I interact with. Uh, Non-backwards compatible updates to theorem provers seem common, but necessary, but they can still make working with even only mildly out-of-date forks a pain. All right, so this is feedback from people who have had to ramp up, and these are engineers uh, at Google. Um, it's super helpful talking to someone that already knows their way around the various tricks and pitfalls. So this really speaks to having access to an expert when you're using these tools. Uh, there's also a lot of infrastructure that's needed for projects at scale and the issues are compounded um, with regards to documentation because they're quite project specific and under development. Uh, there's probably room for standardizing this infrastructure, uh, but of course this is a challenging problem uh, in its own right. I don't know if there's a... Just a quick clarification question, if I may. Yeah. Uh, in the previous slide, uh, you're, uh, someone is complaining about uh, non-backward uh, compatible changes to the theorem uh, prover. Mm -hmm. Does that also imply or cause changes to production code? That influences production code, yes. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that um, in the future. But it, it does make it difficult to have production level code. Thank you. Yes. 
Perfect. Um, okay, then there's also more feedback, and this is really about saying if you're an expert, maybe you make very quick progress. Uh, if you're not an expert, maybe some automation within the tools would help save some time. Uh, when it comes to formal methods tooling, I think automation is a topic all on its own and, and probably deserves um, its own talk. Right, so we would like to make more use of tools and, and tool chains. Um, and it would be great if they were more accessible to more engineers. But as the feedback suggests, these tools and tool chains are very complicated to use. Um, they are still largely academic proof of concepts. Um, you need to be highly skilled or have access to someone who's highly skilled to be able to use them. And perhaps the situation is understandable because there hasn't been much corporate level investment in producing polished toolings. Now that's not true in all cases. There are some companies in the, in the formal method space, but largely these tools and tool chains are still academic in nature. So easy to follow ramp up documentation is difficult to come by or it's lacking and documentation quality seems to vary across many of the tools. Um, sometimes the documentation seems to be very good for very simple examples, but more complicated um, when it comes to elaborate use cases. So something that I come up against as well as when we're talking about using more formal methods is that the benefits are not always that easy to sell. And, and this links back to production level code. We don't want to use code that we don't understand. We don't want to use code that we can't maintain. We're not in the game of producing one-offs that maybe you need for a publication, right? The proofs and the code need to be maintainable for the long term. And also when it comes to sort of building models and, and the protocol tools, we often get the question, well, how do you know that a model is appropriate and, and correct? Um, of course, this applies more generally to provably, provable security, but, um, you know, we do get this question, particularly with regards to the security guarantees when you've modeled something. Of course, when you find a big attack in a big protocol, you can see the benefits, um, but you have to be able to motivate why doing this stuff at scale and at a large company is worthwhile. Right, so we think that there are things that will definitely help. So perhaps more usability research um, in this space. We have work in the area of cryptographic libraries and cryptographic APIs. Maybe it can extend to the specific formal methods case. Uh, also, maybe some more systemization of knowledge, some SOK type work in the area covering the pros and cons of the different tools and the tool chains. Now, there is already some work here, but perhaps there could be more. Also, improved documentation and debugging. Um, you know, descriptive, useful error logging is very, very important to a user's experience when they're using these tools. And also, honestly documented limitations are much better than surprises when you're using a tool. So be that with regards to functionality or even the security guarantees that you get when using a specific tool. Um, and we've, we've spoken about this, that you know, th this needs to be maintainable over the long term, so stable and well-maintained releases are really important when you want to start using this code at the production level. Right, now we acknowledge that none of this is easy, right? And this talk isn't meant to be a laundry list of, of complaints. It's also about asking the question, how can we help? How can we help tool builders and maintainers, right, to make sure that we can use tools at scale for production level code? And perhaps this is an area where industry and academia need to work even more closely together, um, whatever that may look like. And, and we are very happy um, to take suggestions. So um, thank you very much. And I must thank the people who are doing all the really hard work. So, and that, that is the team. So thanks again. Thank you. So this is the, the RTF, so we were allowed to clap for people. It's not, <laughs> it's not, it's not the horribly uh, cold IETF at all. So, <laughs> so again, if you have questions, uh, please join the queue if you can uh, in the Media tool. And, uh, but if you can't, that's fine. Go ahead. Chris, you are actually in the queue. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for the talk, Tyler. I'm wondering if uh, Google is honing <sighs> in on a small number of different tools. By tool, I mean things like Proverif or Tamarin, blah, blah, blah. Lean, I guess, is the cool, cool kids do mm -hmm. lean now. Um, are you honing in on like, like a small number of tools or are you, are you planning on kind of having expertise in many, many tools? Right. Uh, that's a good question. We're a very small team right now. So we'll probably start with a small subset of tools, but we want to have the space to explore the different tools. And this is where sort of 
clearly documented limitations or pros and cons of all of the different tools will be incredibly useful when we make these types of decisions. So long term, the world, like in 10 years, you expect we'll be using a lots of different tools still. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Alexander. Could you provide some more details about the 20% speed up? Was it just because it was rewritten in assembly? Yes. Or well, oh, I, I can tell you briefly what happened. So there was some sort of gnarly assembly that we had that, that wasn't that great. Uh, then we used the cock theorem proof and we got some nice formally verified C. And then the crypt op framework helped to um, produce very, like take that and make it into very fast assembly code. So. So that's, that's sort of what happened. We basically didn't start with something that was ideal. And we weren't expecting such a big performance improvement, actually. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Fanny. Thanks, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> More coffee, good guess. Um, so our, our next speaker is remote. Uh, all going well, it may work. Yes. Um, so. Joshua, we can pass you control of the slides. Do you know how to do that? Or... <laughs> if you pop up the list of attendees. There can you all hear me? Yes, yeah. yeah, we can see you and hear you. You can hear us, I guess. Okay, great. Uh, we're in the, just in the process of giving you control of the slides. Sounds great. So if you click on, here. Click on his icon there, yeah. Pass slide control. So you should, Joshua, you should see the um, kind of slide numbers at the bottom of your screen that you can kind of click through them yourself. Yep, that works great. Thank you. Excellent. That's, that's great. And there, uh, I'll start a timer. You, you probably see it also on screen uh, just to keep us on schedule as well. Okay, thank so you. you go. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So yeah, uh, I'm Joshua Ganter. I'm a postdoc uh, currently at CMU. I work with Brian Pardo, and our group does all kinds of you know cool applications on... Um, verifying related, you know, various parts of the internet infrastructure. And I'll be talking about uh, what's mostly my work today, which is verifying security protocols end to end with OWL. So um, as the title of this talk suggests, OWL is a new language developed by a group here at CMU for developing security protocols. So think of the same ones that like Tamarin targets, like TLS, WireGuard, Signal, these kinds of things. One of the big differences though with OWL is that we're really optimized towards verified implementations. So we envision OWL not only to be a tool for analyzing protocols, but also a development environment for building realistic secure by construction protocol implementations that you can deploy. So in, indeed, our vision is to develop formally verified implementations of protocols that can serve as drop-in replacements, like a verified version of WireGuard that can simultaneously guarantee, among other things, functional correctness, meaning the code does the right thing, Memory safety, meaning the code does not introduce memory errors that could later become attacks. And last but not least, the protocol is designed securely, which means that the protocol has a cryptographic guarantee. Um, in a bit more detail, the L framework looks a little bit like this. So the uh, user provides a protocol written in our programming language, and L first performs a novel type-based analysis to make sure that it's secure. And after the protocol is checked for security, we run it through our extraction pipeline, which produces verified Rust code. That's not only functionally correct and memory safe, but also resistant to certain side channel attacks and will have competitive performance. Additionally, the L framework not only gives excellent benefits for verification, but it's also fully automated. After you write the protocol in the L language, you're basically done because the security analysis and extraction steps are both fully automatic. So to see how OWL works, let's first take a look at this type of security analysis, which is the basis of a paper that we presented at uh, IEEE SNP this year. So our protocol security analysis guarantees a very strong property called computational security. So to understand what computational security is, uh, let's first compare it to symbolic security. So symbolic security doesn't model the crypto directly but instead considered as a somewhat simplified mathematical model using a term algebra. So for example, uh, symmetric encryption is fully specified by these functions for encryption and decryption and the equation that says that decryption is correct given the ciphertext. Um, and then any security properties that you get out of the symbolic encryption 
will fall out of these equations and these functions because you assume the attacker can only manipulate the cryptographic data through these functions and equations. For example, these axioms imply already that encryption is perfectly hiding and ciphertexts are unforgeable. However, these axioms do not allow the attacker to, for example, learn the length of messages through ciphertexts, which happens easily in practice. Um, on the other hand, computational security models the crypto in a very low level way using bytes. Uh, and instead um, of simplifying away the mathematical details, we specify the cryptography directly uh, via their security properties. So for example, we specify encryption by saying that messages remain secret, cybertexts are unforgeable, and so on. And consequently, computational security considers a very strong attacker model and allows any possible instantiation of the crypto primitives as long as they don't violate these assumed security properties. So in OWL, we strive for computational security, not only because it leads to more realistic implementations, um, since there's no symbolic abstraction. Um, unfortunately, computational security is somewhat less popular today because it's thought of as being harder to obtain. Uh, and to change the story, the biggest novelty of OWL is that we introduce a new paradigm for guaranteeing computational security by using a type system. So our type system is actually rather simple. So for example, we have typing rules that say if K is an encryption of things of type T and M has type T, then encrypting M under K results in a public value that you're allowed to put on the network. So using typing rules that look like this, we guarantee security via type checking. This means that we prove ahead of time that for any protocol P, if P is well typed, then P is secure. I can't get into detail exactly what security means, but it's essentially like an information flow property. Confidential data should not get leaked to the attacker and high integrity data actually contains what it should contain. Uh, most importantly, this proof of security via type checking is a one-time upfront proof effort. And because we've already proven this fact, the protocol developer only needs to use the type system to get security. This is great because writing well-typed code is much easier than proving your protocol secure directly. And in particular, using a type system gives you a new automatic modular proof strategy that did not exist before for computational security. And the great thing about type systems is that they're naturally modular. So using OWL, you can do modular proofs of protocols using type-based type abstraction, just like you'd see it in an ordinary language like Go or Rust. So for example, suppose you have a protocol that first establishes keys and then uses these keys to perform a data transfer. Since these are logically two different phases of a protocol, it'd be better to prove them independently. And indeed, you can do this in OWL by having the data transfer and handshake protocols live in different program modules so that the data transfer module uses the handshake module. Crucially, our type system allows the data transfer module to type check only using the specification of the handshake and not any underlying implementation. This is great because it allows you to instantiate the handshake in any way you want as long as it matches the specification. For example, you can do the handshake with public keys using a public key infrastructure, or you can do it with pre-shared keys or maybe even a combination of the two. So now switching gears a little bit, I'll tell you about our verified extraction. And this is all ongoing work. So to obtain verified secure implementations, we're currently working on leveraging Veris, which is a new verifier for Rust programs uh, developed here at CMU that takes advantage of Rust's ownership type system, like the borrow checker and so on, uh, for easy proofs. So to obtain verified implementations, we're writing uh, what we're calling a proof producing compiler. So what this means is that given a well-typed protocol in OWL, we output a few things. First, we output a human readable mathematical functional specification of the program shown here on the top. And on, on the bottom here, we have an executable safe Rust implementation of the protocol on the bottom that we prove in an automated way using Veris that the low-level implementation faithfully matches this functional specification. Uh, the functional specification is meant to be manually auditable. 
indeed, it's almost exactly equal to the code uh, that you put into Owl in the first place. While the executable implementation will have all of like the gory low-level details, like a verified parser uh, that we're also working on separately in Veris, um, zero copy ciphers, which and to do this, we'll kind of leverage other verified work for crypto, like the EverCrypt framework and things like this. So to relate these two uh, worlds, Veris also, uh, what well, we also give to Veris is an auto-generated proof script that's kind of embedded inside of this implementation. So this proof script will ensure that the code is memory safe, that's kind of given to you for free by Rust, um, functionally equivalent to the specification and side channel resistant. Given the proof script which our compiler generates, Veris then goes on and verifies that our code is correct fully automatically. So that's the tool chain that we've been scaling up in recent months. Uh, let me just tell you about our um, what we're doing currently, which is uh, working on WireGuard. So our first large WireGuard is our first uh, like large scale application for Al. We've done other case studies before, especially in our S and P paper. But WireGuard is kind of the biggest kind of realistic one we're doing uh, right now. So WireGuard is a modern, if you don't know about WireGuard, it's a modern secure VPN protocol that uses state-of-the-art crypto and is designed to be extremely fast. It's very widely used as it's now like, for example, embedded in the Linux kernel. But at the same time, the core protocol is incredibly lean. Indeed, it's implementable in about 4,000 lines of code. And because it's so important and so widely used it's a perfect candidate for formal verification. However, despite this, there does not yet exist a usable plug, like, you know, drop-in replacement for a verified wire guard. And that's what we're hoping to, um, to do with OWL, is to create a uh, version of the wire guard handshake that's formally verified that, you know, anybody can just go in and use directly. Um, so that's OWL. It's a new end-to-end -end verification framework uh, for security protocols that uses a type system to guarantee security. Um, our type system guarantees modularity and automation by default, guaranteeing computational security. And we're currently working on a verified extraction pipeline for real world protocols like WireGuard. And in the future, we'll work on you know, bigger and better ones as well. Um, the project page is here. You can download Owl and you know, play with it yourself if you want. It's like written in a, uh, in a type checker written in Haskell. Um, and my email address is here if you have any questions offline. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Felix? Hi, my name is Felix. Thanks for the intro. Um, I have three questions. I hope all of them are easily answerable. So if I got it right that uh, users don't specify security properties, yeah? Uh, the security properties are kind of born out of the Types. So the so the type system in OWL is kind of a combination of information flow and refinement type checking, if you know what that is. Um, so that means that it's kind of an alternative way to specify types uh, compared to like Tamarin or uh, CryptoVerif. But um, it's kind of, I would argue, is kind of an equally expressive way to write them down. Okay. And so do you uh, assume symmetric clients? And how do you handle, so like, what I mean by that is, do you assume your code speaks with another instance of your code? You know, because you, you might write a code for a client and for a server. So it, these could be completely separate code bases. So I, and I would expect a connection there somehow. Yeah, that's a, and, that's a really and, good and, question. Yeah. And maybe connected to that, uh, how do you handle the network layer where someone reorders messages or the likes? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I should have a backup site for this. But um, basically what happens is, uh, similar to other um, protocol verifiers, you kind of specify the entire protocol in one proof development. Uh, so you specify the client and the server together, and indeed you actually write these like cryptographic invariants that tie the two together. Um, and then ex the extraction pipeline gives you implementations of each party separately. Um, so you kind of write a gl global protocol. And to answer your second question about the network, um, so Al assumes a kind of a generic, fully untrusted network setup where the adversary is kind of uh, you know, serving as the network. Um, so like message reorder, for example, is like already built in because you 
assume no properties at all about the um, messages coming from the network other than the, other than implicitly they're coming from this adversary. Great, thanks. Chris? Yeah, thanks very much. This is, uh, this strikes me as like everything that I want in a tool like this. So I'm very skeptical, <laughs> but, um, but like, yeah, I mean, really, really cool work. Um, here's my main question about the, I really like the, the idea of expressing side, you know, sort of like what you want to prove about the thing in, as a type system, like as a, as like a programmer, that's really intuitive. Um, but as like a cryptographer, so how do I connect? Like, I, I, I'm wondering in what sense is this computational security? So how would I how would I express like indie CPA for symmetric encryption um, in OWL? That's a yeah, that's a great question. So um, so OWL kind of takes a different perspective related to other kind of computational um, provers. So we kind of bake. Um, crypto assumptions like NCPA or cyber text integrity, that kind of stuff, that's kind of baked into the type system. So the type system kind of relies on um, a certain crypto primitive being in CPA. And from that, you get out security assumptions. So for example, you get out that, you know, when I decrypt um, a cipher text, as long as the key remains secret, um, the cipher text contains what it should contain. And this is a uh, you know, coming from ciphertext integrity. Um, so you don't specify crypto assumptions directly, but Al comes with crypto assumptions, and the type system is relatively extensible, so you can add new ones as well uh, with some effort. Very interesting. Thank you so much. Ori. Right. Ori Steele. Um, thanks. Fascinating talk. I queued for essentially the same reason. I just want to understand the. Uh, how computational security is achieved. And it does sound like it is baked into the assumption that the types are implemented consistently in binary and that, that, that it's not just the type system, but it's the compiler for the specific type system. So there's sort of this other layer underneath the type system that's ensuring that property. And then that raises the question of like, for what different classes of type system with their unique compiler versions is this property maintained. So, you know, I don't, I'm not a great Rust programmer, but you know, can I use other type systems for this? At what point do I pick a type system like TypeScript's type system? And then I like lose some of these properties perhaps. That's yeah, sure. Question. So um, I would say that like this property is, so first let me explain a little bit about how it works. So how it works is, we have like a very specific type system that has like certain features that you don't find in type systems like Rust or TypeScript. So for example, we have like refinement types uh, and which means basically that you can prove arbitrary predicates about uh, programs um, in the type system. So it's a very expressive one. Um, and the second uh, thing I wanna say is that the, um, the way that we guarantee security is a type systems proof which means that we kind of do a crypto proof about the protocol, but kind of on paper, that's kind of generic for every protocol. And the thing that you like induct over is the typing judgment. Um, so what this means basically is that the type system and kind of the proof that the type system uh, guarantees a certain cryptographic security guarantee is kind of like fully intertwined. So there's really no notion in which you could like replace it with like another type system. It's more of a notion of like you extend the type system in certain ways to get new properties. Thanks. Great. Thanks again, Joshua. And sorry for the messing around, getting a projection working and so on. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to click that? Or do you want to hand control? I can click. Good to go. Great. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I'm Lucas Pardew. I co-chair the Quick Working Group. If some of you know that, that's a transport protocol. But actually, I care more about application protocols. So I'm a kind of a, a moonlighter. Um, but really, what I care about is more about the, the, the interface between application protocols and transport protocols. This kind of weird thing that maybe causes interactions that aren't necessarily uh, easy to predict. 
I'm not going to talk specific, specifically about that, but it will come up in the slides. So when it does, I'll try and remember to mention it. But if I don't, I've got it out of the way. So HTTP2 is uh, the second version of HTTP. The click is not working. Sorry. Thank you. Um, and this rapid reset thing is, is new. It was done between the last IETF and this IETF, hence why I'm a bit tired. Uh, because it affected various big cloud operators around the world. Cloudflare, for instance, my employer, uh, but others that you may have known about. We blogged about this, others have too, um, but I wanted to focus on the protocol aspects of this and to really ask the room, the researchers and folks here, is there something we can do to think about um, analysis of this protocol? This is a, a protocol feature, so it's not a bug, it's a feature that causes some issues in some implementations or deployments, not all, um, and this is something that was discussed during standardization, but evidently not changed. Uh, there were other things in 2019 um, that were identified, again, not bugs in the protocol, but uh, facets of how implementations work that could lead them to uh, overcommitment of states or overuse of CPU, given certain uh, protocol traffic patterns in the HTTP2 layer. So I want to explain a bit about HTTP2, just to get a baseline which requires talking a bit about HTTP and then we'll go into them. Um, but yeah, this is like the biggest layer seven DOS we've ever seen three times our previous record. Um, and it's a really simple attack. Why didn't this come to light earlier? Because this protocol was standardized many moons ago. Uh, so just very briefly, yeah, HTTP request response protocol. We have these drafts that talk about the semantics, things like messages, <clears throat> get requests, responses, caching, et cetera, et cetera. Those things are common across all versions of HTTP. And then we have these different wire formats, HTTP 1 or 1.1, 1 .1, 2, and then 3. Um, <clears throat> there's not much difference between what they can do feature-wise, but how they look on the wire and how they behave and how the control plane of those protocols operates is, is subtly different. There's more in common between HTTP 2 and HTTP 3. The only real difference is that the connections over which these things run vary by the, the transport layer underneath them, either TCP and TLS or quick. I'm ignoring plain text because it's lame. Um, we have these message exchanges, right? Uh, you send a request, which is a composition of some metadata that includes the method, get or post, which mean different things, a path, a host, some header fields that maybe carry things like a user agent or a cookie, and there's some optional content. In the old days, this was referred to as payload, but now it's, it's called content. This is data, and the meaning of that data is described by other parts of the message. So um, you might post uh, an image of your puppy up and can include a content uh, encoding header that says it's uh, gzips, or the, the, the content type is a JPEG or something like that. And similarly, in the reverse direction, there's, the server's going to receive that request, do something with it. What that is, I don't know. Um, HP is built around intermediaries a lot. So even if the server that receives that request um, could respond, it would need to pass it to some backend to process that and do something with it. Um, so just bear that in mind as we go through. Uh, again, you can respond with headers and optional content, et cetera, et cetera. So HP 1.1 would use a TCP connection. There's something called pipelining. We're just going to ignore that today. But effectively, a single HTTP 1.1 connection can be used for multiple requests and responses, but they need to be strictly serial due to the way that those things are serialized and written to the wire. There's no way to interleave them safely. Um, we could go into the details, they're boring, but effectively, you have to do a whole request and then wait for the whole response to come back, and then you can issue the next request, and you keep repeating that. Web browsers do clever things by making more connections. Again, nothing to do with that here. HTTP2, um, it's different, it's better. A single connection can again be used for multiple requests and responses, but there's multiplex and concurrency. This, this is the, the reason for the design is to address the problems we had with 1.1, driven mainly around performance. Um, and the way this works in a nutshell is that you just divide the connection into, into these logical streams. Each one has a numerical ID. And then we divide those messages, requests or response into different parts to, that carried in frames that are then conveyed over streams. So the metadata bits I mentioned, those are carried in a headers frame. And then the optional data parts are in data frames. Uh, and you can multiplex then. You have identifiers that link 
specifically the parts or subparts of these messages to the streams that they belong with. Um, and that can make the sequence diagram faster. But that sequence diagram is BS because actually when you look at the, uh, the TCP or TLS layer, the client's gonna generate a bunch of these things and then it's gonna emit them and the receiver's gonna collect them into a buffer or uh, into a TLS record it can actually decrypt in whole. And it's gonna read all of these frames all at once. So in this example, the client has, uh, is issuing three requests, three headless frames to the server and the server will respond to them. It could respond to them in any order. Like I said, these could be interleaved, but in this example, the server sending back headers and data for the, the three streams that were requested. Um, and this comes into you know, the concurrency and parallelization I've been kind of hinting at that uh, this is cool, but it's also an immediate DOS fact. Anyone would say, well, you can do much more work in one connection. Um, what's like, that's good, but it's also bad because it's much easier to generate a lot of work and allocate more resources on the server that's doing this thing. Concurrency isn't new. You, you, you can just create loads of TCP connections and hit a server with uh, HTTP 1.1, but traditional DOS protection can look at SIM floods or various other things. So HTTP 2 kind of changed the game a bit and lots of folks were able to adapt to that and modify their systems. Um, or we build protections into the protocol itself. So we have this thing called max concurrent streams, which allows a server or the client, but focus on the server in this case, to declare how many concurrent streams that they're willing to support. Um, if you try and open a stream and you know, that, you'll, that stream will count towards the limit. If you close it, it will not count towards the limit. If you hit the limit and you try and open the stream, the server will reject it. It's not a connection level error. We'll just say, sorry, can't do that right now. Try again. So just park that a moment and we're gonna think about canceling requests. You might have all had something where you're doing a large file download and you decide you don't need it anymore. You just wanna turn it off. Um, and then you can do that with a 1.1, but it's very terminal. The, the only way you can really do it is till, kill the TCP connection. In H2, that's, that's even worse. You've got all of these concurrent things happening. If you just want to stop one transfer of data, uh, you don't want to take down everything. So HP2 defined this other frame called reset stream, which allows canceling just one. The client, if we go back to our previous example, could send these three headers frames and then decide even before the service responded, actually, I don't need that first request. Um, an example of this is just doing a page navigation. You know, you, you've loaded one tab and now you switch to the other tab. Let's try and reuse that connection and make the, the best use of the bandwidth for good throughput. Um, and you can see the server's only responding to those two things. Talk about opening and closing streams. Every stream has its own lifetime model. It's even more complicated than this. I don't have the time to go into it in detail, but um, there's various states that streams belong to. And the, the sending and receiving of frames drive the state machine through various processes. There's this flag called end stream. Again, can't go into that right now, but what you can see in this example is very quickly, the client and the server are synchronized in their view. But because it's a reliable transport underneath, as soon as the client sends a frame, it will know that the server will at some point receive it. And then the state has transitioned from idle effectively rapidly through closed. And that stream credit gets consumed and then returned immediately against the settings concurrent stream limit. So as long as the limit's a bit bigger than zero, if clients are immediately doing this, the concurrency limit's effectively useless. And this is the crux of the rapid reset issue is that part of the protocol protections didn't help, but also that, uh, well, from a protocol perspective, just a HTTP2 server, the act of creating request state and tearing it down it's not really that hard, yet Cloudflare and multiple other services saw some kind of denial of service. It's a big spike, it's cool. It's on the, on the blog, go and read that. So the question is why, why was this happening actually? I said, this affected some, but not all implementations. Um, from HP intermediation, like I say, th th there's a general kind of design pattern that you'll have a TLS decryption proxy uh, in front of all of the business logic. Um, this does more than just TLS decryption. It, it takes HTTP2 and, and converts that wire format into the common semantic that it can then pass upwards. Everyone talks HTTP, the wire version doesn't necessarily matter. 
And what we have here is a bunch of incoming connections that all have a bunch of streams on them. Um, and the connection between that decryption proxy that's turning them into messages, each message is then conveyed over a single Unix domain socket to the business logic proxy. And effectively what we saw was that the act of destroying that domain socket had some kind of lag to it. And there's a finite number of them. So although the TLS decryption proxy could keep up, the, the, the communications between the two couldn't, and effectively we just ran out sockets and started return errors from our decryption proxy. And that's it. The high level summary is that uh, the protocol features working is designed and that was published in 2015. It can be abused um, to exploit characteristics of some implementations or the deployments of those implementations. Um, this resulted in some mass scale attacks in 2023. The potential of this was already discussed, but you know, you thought it'd be okay. I don't know. I wasn't part of the discussion. It's all on the mailing lists. Um, I just want to discuss, you know, is there anything about formal methods that can maybe provide an opportunity to do better? Not to text something we didn't think about, but maybe model it. Is the modeling and the tooling that we haven't discussed, which is beyond my comprehension most of the time, does it, can it model this kind of uh, wider system effect? So if there's any questions or comments, I'd love to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Phil Hunt Baker here. Yeah, I'm, ve I'm very, I like this presentation a lot, not least because it wasn't my fault. <laughs> uh, to answer your question, and I'm having to dredge this up for 30 years ago now, I believe that you could model this using CSP. And I think that what you would look for is to prove that the um, traces are bounded in certain ways. I think that you could probably sh arrive at a proof. Um, I mean, basically, what you need here is um, to have better feedback in the back end system. And that's what it comes down to. The, 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 the problem is one of system composition rather than the protocol itself. Um, but yeah, it can be modeled. Yeah, and uh, to respond to that, I've just forgotten what point I was going to make, sorry. Like, y yes, this is, we, we, feedback is very important. Delaying control loops results in bad effects, I think. So. Yeah, the problem there is um, getting into timed models. Uh, like, the, like I say, the, the, this isn't a problem until it suddenly becomes a problem. You know, people were already resetting requests a lot. They could, it's fine. But at what point is too much, too much? And, and that depends on actual resource limits of real things. Simulating that is possible, but to me, it seems quite hard. So, so uh, I'm not going to stand up at the line, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm very glad, PHP, you said uh, CSP, because that was exactly what I thought would be how you'd model this. So. What, what is CSP? Communicating sequential processes. I was going to say late 60s, yeah. Tony Hall, late, well, 70s, maybe. Okay, cool. Thanks. There, there are probably more modern tools now, but I don't know what they are. Right. Uh, okay, if there are no more questions, I think we can thank the speaker again. Okay, and uh, our last speaker is going to be Corey. Are you going to host control? If you don't mind doing it, just give it up. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Corey Myers, and I'm here just to give an update um, on a discussion that began at the last meeting about sample problems in this working group, or uh, research group, excuse me. 
um, one of the things that we talked about at uh, 117 was uh, defining sample problems that can bridge the work of this research group with what other working groups in the IETF are doing um, for the goal of both bringing uh, non formal methods people, which would include me at this point, um, into this work and um, also providing basis for comparison of what different tools um, can be used for in a, in a tractable way. Um, Stephen had introduced a draft uh, proposing uh, modeling IMAP search. Um, and in discussion, there was interested in finding a protocol um, self-contained enough that it could be modeled in its entirety um, for rigor rather than just pulling out um, a command of a larger protocol. Um, Hannes volunteered to do OAuth DPOP, uh, and I, looking to sort of apprentice myself to a learning task here, um, volunteered to help out with that. I got the next slide. Yeah, Thanks. Sorry. Um, we wound up doing something entirely different um, based on uh, Hannes's familiarity uh, with the TEEP uh, protocol for trusted execution of error provisioning. Um, we decided that it was a good candidate uh, for modeling for several reasons. Um, and we go into those reasons in more detail in the draft, but the two that I'll pull out here um, are one, it's a protocol still under active development. And so um, modeling it is a way of actually testing the design decisions that are still being uh, made and standardized. Um, and also a way to use the process of modeling it as a way of getting more people familiar with it within the IETF. Um, and the second is that it's expressly concerned with security. And so uh, it can be modeled not just for its liveness and correctness, but also for the security properties that it's designed uh, to achieve. Again, more detail in the draft, but those are sort of the two to um, highlight for now. Um, um, so we've got two revisions of the draft um, currently um, submitted uh, and completely in parallel, um, Tetsuya Okuda for the TEEP working group has actually uh, proposed two uh, draft models of TEEP, uh, one in Proverf, one in Tamarin. Um, and, uh, kind of by analogy actually to the purpose of defining these sample problems, there's a nice cyclical relationship there too in that we can use um, the sample models to test the draft of actually specifying that as a problem as well as um, examine how the models uh, demonstrate or don't demonstrate um, what we suggest the, uh, the other protocol itself is useful uh, for proving. Um, we'd welcome feedback um, on the draft and otherwise defer to the chairs and the research group uh, for next steps. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions for Corey before he disappears? Yeah, excellent. And uh, since the um, IMAP search example was mentioned, there, uh, there has been no progress, I'm afraid, sorry. <laughs> but I will, I, I will get back to it. Going for feedback on. Yeah. We have just that again. Yep. Uh, there you go. So, uh, one of the things we want to use the uh, last few minutes of this uh, session to discuss was how people felt the training on Sunday went. Um, was there anybody who attended or who didn't attend? who thought it was good, bad, could be improved. Uh, any feedback is much appreciated. So just to, how many people here were at part of the training on Sunday? Oh, good, good. Just enough. Great. So it's, it's entirely fine to send us your feedback as an email to the chairs or over coffee, uh, but we'd appreciate it if, uh, if anybody now had a chance to offer some feedback from Peter. Uh, Chris. Chris. There are two Chris's in the queue, I'm sorry. We'll, Chris first and then... <laughs> we'll, we'll take Chris and then Chris. Uh, so I did attend the training. I thought it was actually excellent, but I will say that from a recording point of view, I'm not sure it would have too much value because the real value in my mind was the fact that we did exercises and there were experts in the room to help us. And so I don't know that it's repeatable in any way other than to get people in a room again. Um, and so that was the one downside for me. You have really had to be there to get the value out of it. Yeah. Um, Chris P. Uh, yeah, I agree with Chris. 
basically completely. Let's do it at the next IETF. Maybe, I mean, I think getting deeper into Tamarin would be great, but um, I'd also like to get exposure to other things that people think are of value. So I don't know if we're pitting ProVerif against, I mean, our first draft is going to pit ProVerif against Tamarin, it sounds like, which is great. So maybe we learn ProVerif next time. So um, before you disappear, Chris, would you be interested in a tutorial on something more general like Coq or uh, what Tyler was mentioning, uh, Fiat Crypto? Um, I mean, Fiat Crypto is not a general tool. As I understand, it's for generating like finite field arithmetic, basically, in different languages, which is like useful to know for sure. Mm. Um, I would say cock a uh, hard no, just because it's too general. Um, I think, I think directing like protocol designer like myself towards the thing that is most accessible is 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 the most useful thing. Okay, thank you. Uh, Gugly. Uh, Felix, thank you for all the training. But uh, so it was more uh, a hands-on training to try it out, Tamarin but I could have enjoyed uh, more of a lecture. That's what my feedback is. Okay. Um, so I think we've drained our queue, uh, in which case I, I want to ask, do people agree in general with Chris P that they would rather security tool focused training or do we think uh, next time we could do COC or some other more general tool or something not security focused? as I think that is in our charter. Mm -hmm. OK. Oh, you, you, you've got people in the queue again. Yeah, oh, we've got people in the queue again. Excellent. Uh, yeah, we, we, we had one call from the room for general for the record. Um, I very much appreciated the presentation at 117 about uh, Isabel. Um, and that seems like a good, somewhat more general purpose tool that could be on the yeah, training for book as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Felix. Yeah, I might be a bit biased, but I, I find um, uh, interactive theory improvers to be very intimidating. And I think especially in an audio, in like in a research group that's called usable formal methods, I don't think that interactive theory improvers are the tools we should try to target to make more usable in the beginning. Like they are the pinnacle of what humanity can prove kind of, right? And <laughs> Um, I mean, they are great tools, but they are so specialized. Mm. I would, for example, love a session on Proverif because I don't know the tool very well. And um, I think these tools can also be reasonably taught in a time frame such as the one we had on Sunday, which I don't think to be true for theorem provers. Okay, thank you. Um, Ori. Hi, Ori Steele. Um, I think Proverif can be easily taught in a short period of time. So. Um, I don't claim to be an expert on it at all, but I learned, I picked up enough of it to use it in a weekend for something. So I think it, it that that one can be com compressed. My The reason I came to the, to the queue was to act, actually, I'm following um, work in the RATS working group and in other working groups that deal with serialization formats and verifying the, the structure of uh, binary formats that are based on Seabor or COSY, those kinds of Things and I've noticed some very interesting commits to those repos that are generating those drafts that are doing interesting things where all of their examples get piped back through all of their data definition languages. And I'm wondering if there's interesting uh, GitHub uh, magic in any of the repos that you're aware of that's doing that kind of thing for protocols yet. So just I'm looking for stuff to, to look at that's like that, but not at just the schema validation layer, but at the protocol layer. Uh, I'm not aware of any, but if anyone is, that'd be super cool. Uh, Mohammed. Yeah, hi, Osama from TU Dresden. So my feeling from the training is uh, first, thanks for putting in all the efforts to uh, at short notice, like you had to go from two hours to four hours. It was very nice. But my feeling from the, from the training was that the survey that was initially done, which was that we should target intermediate trainings the initial training material already exists, is already done in RWC or whatever is online available. I would agree with somebody who said that, okay, so the, the real value is going down there and sitting there and see and talk to the, talk to the um, uh, developers or let's say the trainers. 
so in my understanding all the people who were attending were really beginners and had no idea whatsoever how tambourine works and so on so so th th that's my uh, recollection of the thing so what i want to highlight is that it's the, the initial survey that was done which came up with the thing that we should target the intermediate is not probably the right way to do it it's it's the basic which people at idf will appreciate more uh, like the rats working group that he mentioned i presented today our work which we have done for the verification with arm and linaro and um, for the deep at the hackathon we found a problem in the deep protocol verification that was done the initial work they, that they had done for the deep protocol uh, which gori just presented as the sample problem so we had a look at that in the hackathon uh, we found that the way pro verif was understood so there are two different levels of reachability there without going into the details i mean the reachability that they thought is the reachability was not really the way so so it was at the horn process level and not at the uh, applied by calculus level so it was completely misunderstood the people uh, the point i i think i'm making is that people at idf will appreciate more beginner tools rather than going to cock and even at the beginner at the, the tools even also at the very basic level the starting from without any knowledge of the formal method so that that i think will be successful like the one training that we had and last comment that i would make is i'm not a developer of proverif but i have been using it i'm uh, for last four years i will be very happy to support karthik vincent or bruno uh, if they are here so i will be very happy to volunteer uh, i not in canada or i think uh, maybe in the next um, if possible in the europe training i i would be very happy to give it here Okay, thank you. Yep, it's great. Thanks. And I guess we're at time. Uh, thanks all for coming. Thanks to our note takers, Chris and Joe. Uh, I look forward to the wonderful notes. Um, and we'll, do, we'll discuss on list, I guess, next steps and whether to meet at the next ITF and all those kind of things. Uh, so thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>